So I just, um, <clears throat> I mean, just have been really enjoying this conversation and and all of the insights um, that have been shared so far. And um, just wanted to share a little bit about this report that has been mentioned a couple of times on the survival strategies that um, <clears throat> that were used during the pandemic to meet just a whole bunch of needs. Over the past year or so, the Cairo Center talked with communities across the country, organizers, faith leaders, cultural organizers, community-based organizations about what they did to, to make sure that their people were okay. Um, and as we all know, there was just this alarming range of, range of needs that was going unmet, reflecting these deep gaps in our system and institutions, gaps that were created by the by the tax cuts and you know privatization and by misplaced um, national priorities that 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 you know fund war, but not everything we need. Um, and all those gaps still remain, as we as we know. And who stepped into those gaps, as always, are our communities themselves, figuring out how to get sanitizer and showers and beds and clean air and Wi-Fi, just all these things that we need to live to the people who needed them. And um, <clears throat> this isn't new. It's what people have always done um, alongside sharing meals and playing together and, and praying together and mourning together. Um, um, but the pandemic just kind of blew the lid off of this, the, just the extent of, of, of this activity, and as well as the compassion and creativity and courage um, with which it was carried out. And some groups that had never done this before were, were thrown into it because their communities need it. And, and as we've heard over and over again, no one else was coming in to save them. <clears throat> and so despite the challenges that were faced across the board, across all of these strategies. There was also consensus, at least among the people we talked to, that meeting these concrete material needs has to play a more significant role in our organizing and our movements and in our response to these anti-democratic authoritarian threats and the threat of white Christian nationalism. It has to be more, more of a role than it's usually than it than it currently does. And you know, we also know that we're not quite equipped to, to do that at scale. Right, despite the, be the despite the best that our churches and organizations and all the community associations are part of, the best we can do, there's no way we can really respond to the extent of the needed hand or or even some of these threats that are building on the horizon, <clears throat> as we're currently organized and resourced to do. Right, but if and when, as we start to bring these efforts together, the fact is that millions and millions and millions of people are already doing this every day. Right. And they're just, it's going on, and <clears throat> but it's not kind of connected or even consciously politicized as a critique of the status quo and the vision of the society that we deserve, because this work is inherently political. These are all forms of protest. Every project of survival, every survival strategy is a form of protest against government neglect. And as we seek to stand in that gap, we have to highlight the hypocrisy that it's as if regular people have the power to meet these needs, why isn't it happening? And one of the historical examples I'll wrap up with, because I'm just looking at our time, that I think is important to, to hold on to as we face these threats, as we figure out, as we try to make our way through and, and assess what can we really do is, is the Underground Railroad, right? Formerly enslaved people or currently enslaved people were, were running from slavery, seeking their freedom. That was their first act the first act that was necessary to create then a vast network of individuals, of households, communities, churches, schools, every kind of community-based institution that was actually meeting very concrete material needs. And eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually cohered, came together around the common political goal of ending slavery. The network was diffuse, it was dispersed, it didn't quite know what all the other pieces of it were doing, but it was taking action together. And it was led by those who were most impacted by the injustices of that time, by slavery itself. And as a whole, the whole that it was created, that was created was greater than the sum of its parts. And that's, you know, what in our assessments also what we need to do today, right? A movement anchored in this work that is going on out of necessity because our systems are failing us and these threats are killing us and threatening you know, and, and, and making our lives less secure and more dangerous. Can we pull all that together and politicize it to take action together? And if and when we do, 
you know, this network, I think we, we believe that this network of project of survival in these poor frontline dispossessed communities can also be a buttress against extremism and build up the substantive movement for democracy, you know, by turning the needs that people are organizing around into demands of a government of, by, and for the people. So that's, that's the responsibility in our task in this moment. And we just invite everybody in, in to build this with us.